Ladies and gentlemen, the sound you hear is a buzz saw ripping through a painting of George Washington chopping down cherry trees. It's time for Professor Buzzkill, busting myths and taking names. That's right, buzz killers. It's your favorite professor here, back again to bust myths and take names. You know, we keep saying it on this show, and it may come across like some sort of historian's Tourette's, but the more we study the American Revolutionary Period and the stories that are told about the American Revolutionary Period, the more we realize that many of those stories, in fact, most of those stories, are really about 1876 rather than 1776. In other words, a lot of our perceptions about the American Revolution come from stories crafted to celebrate and boost the centennial observations of of 1776, which of course took place in 1876. And one of those stories is about Molly Pitcher, the heroine of the Battle of Monmouth in 1778. Molly, and I'm using the air quotes here, was the legendary wife of a Continental soldier and a water carrier who kept the Continental soldiers hydrated during the battle, as well as pouring cool water on cannon barrels so they wouldn't overheat. When her husband was wounded, she took his place at the cannon side and fought until the battle was won. One of the most dramatic stories about her was that a musket shot, sometimes it's called, it's referred to as a cannonball, went through her legs and didn't hit anything except her petticoats. As cool as can be, she supposedly said something like, well, that could have been worse, without missing a beat and keeping the cannon loaded and all that other kind of stuff. She then fought valiantly throughout the rest of the battle, although it was technically a draw, The moral victory was for the Continentals because they'd beaten the British Army to to that draw. The problem, buzz killers, and you know what I'm going to say, is that there's no good evidence for the Molly Pitcher story. And there are no mentions of Molly Pitcher until 1851. And her identity wasn't linked to real person until 1876. Again, the centennial of the young nation and exactly the time the United States needed an American version of Britain's Queen Bodicea and France's Joan of Arc, two fiery, vigorous female warriors. So let's look at who this person supposedly was. Her name was Mary Ludwig Hayes, and she was from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She's the most common person associated with the Molly Pitcher story. She was born either in Trenton or Philadelphia, the records conflict, and she moved to Carlisle to work as a servant and married a man named William Hayes in 1769. William then joined the 7th Pennsylvania Regiment, and they participated in the Battle of Monmouth, where the famous episode supposedly took place. By then, Mary had become what was known as a camp follower. We're going to explain that a lot later on. Almost certainly, she fulfilled the roles of, that most camp followers fulfilled. She brought water to the soldiers, she fed them, and she helped take care of them between battles. Now, now there are all sorts of other unverified stories about Mary as Molly. One is that a Revolutionary War officer, a guy that we like to call George Washington, saw her fighting and made her an honorary non-commissioned officer. Again, buzzkillers, no evidence whatsoever, just a story. And there are lots of those. But let's get back to what actually happened to Mary. She and William returned to Carlisle after the war. He died in 1786. She remarried in 1787. She continued working as a servant, which she'd done before the war and was apparently granted a small annual pension from the Pennsylvania legislature for her war service. She was granted this in 1822. Now, it's not at all clear whether she was granted it for her war service or for being the widow of someone who had uh, of a soldier, her husband. She died in 1832 and was buried in an unmarked grave. Probably would have been the end of the story. We never would have heard of Molly Pitcher or Mary Ludwig Hayes as Molly Pitcher. But the centennial of 1776 started to approach 50-ish years later, and towns and cities across the original 13 colonies went on a binge to find local worthies from the revolutionary period that they could celebrate. Later, a statue to Molly Pitcher, in quotes, was erected in Carlisle in 1916. The U.S. Postal Service put Molly Pitcher on a stamp in 1928, which was the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Monmouth. And a Liberty ship named the Molly Pitcher was launched in 1943 during World War II and unfortunately torpedoed in the same year. That's all very interesting, Buzzkillers. But what's more interesting is that the story of Molly Pitcher gives us a great opportunity to talk about a very overlooked aspect of history. And this is what I get back to, the camp followers during the Revolutionary War. 
Now, camp followers have been around as long as war has been around. Often these were women, usually the wives of soldiers, but there were other types of camp followers, including doctors, cooks, people doing uniform and boot repair, and even children who were used as messengers and for other menial tasks. These people followed the armies, followed the regiments, followed the battalions, whatever they were, as they went from battle to battle. As you can imagine, there were far more things to do in a modern army, and by modern army, I mean an army since it built since the invention of gunpowder, than could be done just by the soldiers themselves. And the tr tradition of having camp followers, camp helpers, grew dramatically. They were sort of a support service for armies. There were thousands of camp followers on both sides during the American Revolutionary War. Roughly 4,000 British wives sailed across the ocean with their husbands in order to join the effort, in order to be British Army camp followers. A thousand German wives accompanied the Hessian soldiers who boosted British ranks at several important battles. And as many as 5,000 women were camp followers in the Continental Army. Of course, as you can imagine, the numbers vary considerably depending on how close the armies were to towns and cities and all that kind of thing. And the fact that there weren't exactly census takers walking around during battle saying, are you a camp follower? Well, anyway, what did camp followers do? Almost everything, including, in rare circumstances, fighting in battles. Armies during this period, you see, had nothing like what we would recognize as modern or 21st century, certainly, infrastructure. There was no medical corps and no systematic way to feed their soldiers. So camp followers did it all. They did these things and a lot more. Odd jobs, transporting baggage and equipment, tending livestock. Yeah, livestock. They brought livestock with them to slaughter and feed the soldiers. Sewing and uniform repair, as I said, laundry, nursing, and of course, cooking. The standard story or the oft-repeated story, that camp followers are mainly prostitutes is usually exaggerated. Now, there were a few of those, of course, but the vast majority of camp followers were not prostitutes. These camp followers became increasingly important as the Revolutionary War continued because the supply and support networks that the Continental Army had built up had gotten overstretched. They'd gotten worn out. The Army, in effect, needed a large, permanent group of camp followers to serve really as their quartermaster corps, what the modern military would call the quartermaster corps. Now, we can't take our hats off to an actual individual historical figure named Molly Pitcher, Buzzkillers, but we can certainly salute all the camp followers and helpers who work tirelessly in very dangerous conditions and who've been unjustly overlooked by history. We've got lots of further reading and good books for you to follow up with on the Buzzkill bookshelf. And I tell you what, if we can do a little bit of reviving the history of camp followers by talking about the fictional character of Molly Pitcher. It's all right with me. Talk to you next week.